This meeting is now being recorded. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Shelley Sunsweifer. I'm the regional veterinarian for the State Health Department, Region 2-3. And today we have Dr. Janet McAllister, who has been gracious enough to give us a webinar on West Nile virus mosquito control and over. This is a repeat of the webinar that was given last Friday. So we are very grateful to Dr. McAllister for her willingness to do this again. Uh, everyone's phones are muted. For those of you on the webinar, you will have the ability to type questions by clicking on the QA icon at the top of the page. And the QA, the question and answers will be addressed at the end of Dr. McAllister's presentation. For those of you who don't have access to the webinar, for those of you on the phone lines, we will open the phone lines at the end of the webinar to ask additional questions. We know that there are many questions regarding West Nile virus right now, and this webinar is intended to cover mosquito control uh, only. So if you have other related questions, please hold them and either send them to me, uh, and I'll be happy to answer them after the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. McAllister. Uh, Janet McAllister is a board-certified medical entomologist. She attained her PhD from the University of Arkansas. Uh, she has worked on malaria vectors as a visiting fellow with the Division of Parasitic Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. While there, she co-developed several tests for detecting insecticide resistance in vector insects. She then worked for five years at the New Orleans Mosquito and Termite Control District as their senior research entomologist. Dr. McAllister is currently employed at the CDC in Fort Collins with the Division of Vector-Borne Infectious Diseases. She conducts field and laboratory research on control insecticide resistance in important vectors of West Nile virus and participates in emergency responses as a contact for vector control. She is active in the American Mosquito Control Association and the Entomological Society of America, serving on several committees in these associations. She has served as president of the American Mosquito Control Association, the West Central Mosquito and Vector Control Association, and the Louisiana Mosquito Control Association. Thank you very much, Dr. McAllister, for being here with us again today. We really appreciate it. And from there, we'll let you go ahead and start. Okay, thank you, Shelley. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and jump into the presentation. Um, the objectives today, I'm going to talk um, a little bit of just some general principles of trying to control mosquitoes. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about ground-based spraying because I understand that's the majority of the, the spraying that's going on in, in Texas. I'm going to touch a little bit about aerial spraying and then uh, follow up with um, some comments on uh, treating for larvae. So general spraying for mosquitoes, um, there's research out there that indicates that the best way to reduce Culex, um, particularly Culex quinquefasciatus, which is the species that's the, the major vector in West Nile virus in the south um, requires consecutive treatments in an area uh, because on any given night, the mosquitoes that are out flying about that would encounter a um, cloud of insecticide, it's not going to be the entire population. Uh, mosquitoes will actually spend the majority of their time resting, and unless they're actively seeking a host or, or seeking a place to lay their eggs, they um, generally are not out and about flying. Um, peak mosquito activity of the species, it, it varies geographically and it also varies temporally. Um, there are peaks that have been documented from, from um, different places that range from 10 at night to midnight and beyond. Um, this mosquito will fly um, throughout the night, but there are, are definitely um, peaks in activity, uh, and that really depends on, on the area geographically. But also over the course of a season and with weather changes, that peak may be shifted 
um, throughout the night. So if normally you would expect them to be active at 10 p.m. and it's raining, well, they may be more active at 2 p.m. or later in the season as temperatures um, fall or rise at night, that may shift the activity of the mosquito. Um, another thing about spraying in general is that you really need to pay attention to evaluating your spray missions. This is, is critical to know that you're actually reaching the, the target mosquitoes that you're trying to kill. So there should be some form of surveillance going on that is informing you um, where are the mosquitoes so that you can make an informed decision on where you're going to do the spraying. But there should also be some sort of follow-up um, on after you went out and sprayed, did you successfully reduce the population or do you need to actually go back and retreat that area? Um, and then you should also always be um, um, looking at your mosquitoes as far as insecticide resistance or the product that you're using, and is it an effective product being put out at an effective rate for the mosquitoes in your area that you're trying to control. Um, and so retreatment of area really needs to be based on additional surveillance. Um, and, and whether you had a successful spray mission or not. Um, so those are some general spraying um, considerations. And I want to talk mostly about truck-mounted spraying, uh, especially for West Nile virus. So the whole idea of spraying for adult mosquitoes is that you want to kill the infected adult mosquitoes that are capable of transmitting the virus um, today so that there, there is a segment of the population that has taken a blood meal and the virus that they took with that blood meal has incubated in the mosquito and now the mosquito is infectious and it's out looking for its um, next blood meal and that's how the virus is transmitted to people, and so the goal of, of adult deciding is to really to kill those mosquitoes. Um, so when you have an outbreak situation, adult deciding becomes your primary tool of trying to interrupt transmission in that outbreak area. Larviciding should still be a part of your program. But you need to understand that the mosquitoes that you are killing today with the larvicide are not infected mosquitoes. They potentially are not going to be a problem until two to three weeks down the road when they have emerged as an adult. They've taken that first blood meal that has virus, and they have gone through that incubation period. So you want to include larviciding in your program if you're already doing it, um, but, but the primary goal in stopping an outbreak is to kill the infected mosquitoes that are out there in the environment now. Um, also, optimization of spray equipment, it certainly makes it, it more effective. So at, at, I believe in most places, um, a yearly calibration of your e equipment is required. Um, but because you're probably out there spraying um, more than you have been spraying in past years, you're putting a lot more out spray hours on that spray equipment. Um, so you want to pay very close attention to making sure that your equipment is still in good shape and that it is performing um, optimally. Um, so you want to be paying extra close attention to, the, uh, the, to your equipment. Um, effectiveness is also dependent on the infrastructure of the landscape. So when you are treating from the ground um, and you go out and you spray and you go back and you look at, at your traps the next night and you see, wait, my mosquito numbers didn't go down, well, there are a lot of reasons why that may have occurred. And a lot of times it's, it's 
the landscape and the environmental conditions and, and not necessarily that our equipment broke down or that the insecticide was not um, effective. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that landscape because that's really key to um, understanding what the things that you can do to optimize um, killing as many infected mosquitoes as possible. So this is just a screenshot. I, I'm not picking on um, Plano, um, but this is just a screenshot that I randomly pulled off of Google Earth <clears throat> that I'm going to use as an example. Um, so one of the things that you need to be aware of is that when you are spraying from the ground, you're driving down the middle of a road, and you need that material to move from your truck nozzle um, into the yards where the mosquitoes are harboring. And so you, to get that material out of the street and into those yards, you're re um, relying on wind to carry that spray cloud uh, where you want it to go. Um, so you have to play, pay very particular attention to the wind when you are doing a spray mission. But another reason why you might not get good coverage in a neighborhood is because you have additional features out there besides just these roadways that you're driving on that prevent you from treating areas. And that can be um, big parks. It can be schools or industrial areas mixed in there. It can be um, drainages. It can be riparian areas. It can be open spaces. Um, so you really have to pay attention to not just your roadways, um, but also what other features are out there in that landscape. Because if you just drive the streets in the neighborhood, and you're not trying to treat mosquitoes in this area, uh, then you're missing a large part of your population that um, is potentially going to transmit West Nile virus. Um, so homing down a little bit more in, into this area and paying attention to wind direction when you're treating from the ground, Again, um, because you rely on wind to move that material out of the street and into your actual treated area, um, if, if, if you have a, a, a neighborhood or, or an area that you're treating and it's set up on a nice grid with north, south, east, west um, streets, wind is, is not necessarily going to cause you to have treatment gaps because you can always adjust spraying your spray route from going east-west to north-south, depending on the wind direction. Um, where you tend to get gaps in coverage is when you tend to have um, neighborhoods that are not really set up on a north-south, east-west grid, um, where you might have these long blocks that are curved, or you have cul-de-sacs, depending on the direction of the wind. Um, you may not be able to effectively treat areas within that neighborhood. Um, so in this example, if you have the wind coming out of the east and you're driving your trucks down these roads, you're going to get good treatment because that wind is going to move the material off of the road and it's going to move it through these yards. And then you go up the next street and it, it, it's going to treat um, this area quite nicely. Where you run into problems is that if the wind's out of the east and you have streets like this that are very long, and how do you treat the, these houses in here when your only road to access um, that is, is on this east side? So if you're driving um, in an east-west direction, your spray cloud is basically staying in the road or, or in the front yards and being carried by the wind down the street. And it's not going where you want it to be. Um, and that is a, um, something that's difficult to deal with because you can't go out and change the wind direction. Um, but it is something that you need to be aware of because it can create gaps of in your treatment area. So um, and again, the wind. Um, 
changes throughout the night. I just um, threw this in as an example. This is the um, um, weather forecast, hourly weather forecast for Plano, Texas for tonight. Um, and if you look at 10 p.m. tonight, the predicted wind direction is seven miles out of the southeast. And then as the night goes on, it's going to shift around to being due out of the south. And by morning, 7 a.m. in the morning, it should be coming in from the south-southwest. So um, it, it's something when you're putting together your spray missions to be able to optimize treating as, as much as possible from the ground um, is you need to be aware of how the wind is going to potentially shift. Now, most trucks don't have weather stations on them. Um, so it's hard for the operators to know if the wind has um, died down or if it suddenly has gusting up above um, the, the 10 miles an hour that you can um, have the wind blowing to be able to treat. Uh, there are websites like this Weather Underground that you can go to um, to get an idea of what the wind is going to do during the night. Um, there are other sites that you can go to, NOAA, um, where you can, can get updates of what the wind direction is going to be doing locally so you can make adjustments in your spraying during the night. Um, so again, that you can optimize um, getting as many mosquitoes killed during that spray mission as, as possible. Um, sometimes the wind doesn't shift much at all. Sometimes it can shift 100, you know, 90 degrees, in which case um, if the night starts off with the end out of the east and you're, you're driving on the north-south roads to, to make use of that wind, the wind may shift to out of the south. And so you would want to um, switch your spray route so that you're driving uh, east-west to, to optimize that wind moving the material. Um, so in our example, um, again, just for, for tonight's mission, um, starting out at 10 p.m., that wind is going to be coming out of the southeast. Um, and so um, most of the roads that you're going to want to use are going to be the east-west um, moves. Um, roads because it's coming not due south or due east. Uh, you know, for this area, you, you really wouldn't have a whole lot of optimization because that you or changes that you would need to potentially do if this were the area that you were treating tonight. Um, another way to optimize your spraying and and just homing in on the area that was in that red triangle on the left of the screen is again, the, what you're trying to do is you're driving down the street and you are spraying and you want the wind to move that spray out of the street, into the yards, past the houses, and into the backyards. Um, so you have a, um, features in your landscape that can cause shadows in your treatment um, that you really have no control over. Uh, in this picture, there's, there's actually an alleyway in here, and if you look at all these pools and you can see um, the shadow of the privacy fences along here. So if you're treating along something like um, this alleyway in a very low wind situation, pretty much what you're doing is you're treating a canyon. And so one of the, one of the things you can do um, to uh, get the material out of the alleyway is you can um, certainly make sure that the angle of your spray nozzle is pointed up and not pointed straight back. Um, that's that's kind of a, um, a common sense thing. Other than that, um, you know, the, the, the really low, low winds, like one mile an hour, um, those sprays may not be as effective. Um, and so certainly um, you want to be aware of that so, so that you could account for uh, not having good treatment in, in an area. Um, so 
another way that you might optimize your equipment um, or your, your spraying techniques, uh, a lot of people when they have a disease outbreak situation, they will go to a higher label rate because they want to make sure that they're killing as many mosquitoes as possible. Um, and another way that you can ensure that you're optimizing the, the, the droplets in a spray cloud is to actually, besides increase your label rate, is to increase your flow rate. So with this example here, um, I'm not endorsing permanone. I just picked it randomly as an example. Um, but say you have already optimized your spraying by increasing to the highest label rate, which is 0 0.007 pounds per acre, um, and you're using a truck speed of 10 miles per hour. Um, if you're putting that material out undiluted at two ounces per minute, you have a spray cloud out there um, that's cre that has a certain number of droplets in it. If you were to increase your flow rate to 10 ounces per minute by diluting that product, you're going to create a spray cloud that has many, many more droplets. And so the more droplets you have out there, the more chance that you are going to have droplets to impinge on mosquitoes, and you can really increase the effectiveness of spraying simply by increasing the flow rate of your what you're putting out. Um, I do want to point out, though, that um, we, when you're spraying all night and you're trying to cover as much ground as possible and you have just a 15-gallon tank on your truck, um, it might be, um, you, you might think, well, if I put it out undiluted, then I can run that spray truck much longer and cover much more ground. But if the spray cloud is not dense enough that you're really effectively killing the mosquitoes, um, then you're not doing much good. And so by diluting it, you may have to go back and refill that tank or not be able to treat as, as much with that truck in a single night. But you really, the, what you gain in, in increasing the number of droplets in that spray cloud um, and increasing that flow rate as much as possible uh, is really going to benefit you in, in trying to kill those infected mosquitoes that are out there. Um, so just some points on, on optimizing your spraying. Um, another thing that you really need to be uh, aware of or sensitive to is insecticide resistance. And uh, a lot of people think, oh, we don't spray enough. We don't have to worry about insecticide resistance. I do want to point out that pyrethroids, which I believe is is what most people are using in spray trucks in the in the Dallas area, are very common insecticides. They're used pervasively in the urban environment by homeowners. If if you go to the store and start looking at the active ingredient of what's on the shelf for people to use in, in their yards. Um, or for termite control, a lot of it is pyrethroids. In fact, the majority of, of what homeowners can buy off of the shelf are pyrethroids. And then in addition to that, um, pyrethroids are heavily used in, in golf courses and um, in parks for, for treating turf insects. And so they are out there in the environment. And they, those uses can actually select for resistance in mosquito populations uh, because if you're spraying a golf course and then you have runoff for that golf course, it's going to where the mosquitoes are going to be breeding. And so you can get selection for resistance to it in adult mosquitoes um, by treating the larvae with pyrethroids. Um, and I realize that most mosquito control districts in the area probably don't have a program to look for insecticide resistance in, in their mosquitoes, um, but it is something that you need to be aware of, and that's why it's so critical to evaluate your spray missions and your spraying um, practices 
because if you start seeing that you're not killing the mosquitoes, that is something that you, you really have to consider is that you might have insecticide resistance. Um, and for next year or, or for, for um, the future, uh, in testing for insecticide resistance is actually um, a, a, a pretty simple thing to do and doesn't really need to incorporate a lot of extra um, man hours. Um, and, and there is training available on how to do that uh, through the CDC. Um, adjusting label rates, um, increasing label rates. Um, when you have an outbreak situation, that's one of the first things that a lot of people will do just because they want to make sure that they're killing those infected adults. And again, if you do not have an insecticide resistance testing program in place and you're using a low label rate, then even if you do have a low level of resistance in your population, adjusting your label rate to the highest label rate will often uh, offset that resistance in the population um, because it, it is bumping up the rate to the point where you can kill those um, infected mosquito or resistant mosquitoes. Um, and again, keeping up with your proper calibration and maintenance of your equipment as you continue to spray over um, the next month, uh, because you've probably been using that equipment a lot more than you have in past years. Uh, you certainly want to make sure that it's not going out of calibration because of wear and tear. Um, and, and keep a very close eye on, on making sure that it's running properly because if, if you've got something going on and, and you're putting out these really big droplets um, and because of wear on your nozzle, that material is coming out at the end of that nozzle and because it's big and heavy, it's not making it off of the street or, or out of the front yard into the backyards where the mosquitoes are, around the vegetation, and and where people would be spending their time. Um, you certainly want to um, maximize the flow rates. I've already covered that. Uh, and, and again, you want to pay very close attention to the weather conditions, particularly changes in wind direction and wind speed because there are specific wind parameters um, that you can, can have to um, legally use these materials that you're spraying from your trucks. So you need at least a mile per hour of wind to move it, your spray cloud, into the area where the mosquitoes are going to be. But if that, on the other end of that, if the wind is too great, if it's above, for most labels, if it's above 10 miles per hour, then you shouldn't be treating as well because then that wind is, is moving your spray cloud um, too quickly out of the area. So you want it to, to come out of the truck and you want it to move into an area and you want it to move slowly through the area so that you can um, kill as many mosquitoes as possible. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about aerial spraying. I do realize that um, that's not something that is, is commonly done in the Dallas area, um, but I do want to, to cover a little bit about it um, so that you understand what aerial spraying is. Aerial spraying really is, is the same thing as spraying from a truck, it's just you're using an aircraft as opposed to using a truck. Um, in a lot of cases, it's, um, from aerial applications, it can be the exact same chemical that you're using from the airplane as you would be using from the truck. I want to point out that, that this aerial spraying for mosquito control is not crop dusting. Um, you're not putting that plane right down above a plant trying to douse the plant to kill plant eating insects with no drift of the material off of that field. When you're treating for mosquitoes, the planes are usually flying at 200 to 400 feet. Um, 
depending on what kind of towers are in the area and also depending on what the wind is doing um, and what the local weather is doing. Um, sometimes those planes are much lower if you have temperature inversions or, or um, going on and you need to fly under an inversion. Um, but in general, they're not down buzzing the rooftops of, um, of the neighborhoods. Uh, another thing about aerial spraying is that a single plane can treat roughly 40,000 acres a night. Now, depending on the chemical and the rate, um, you could treat more than that or less than that. Um, and if you look at what it takes to, um, with a truck um, to treat the same amount of area, that same 40,000 acres, it would take roughly 30 trucks to cover that much ground in a single night. So tr if you have large areas to treat, um, it, it can actually be much more cost effective to treat by the air, and you can treat a much larger area by air. Um, another thing about aerial spraying is it's not dependent on road systems. So you have minimal gapping in your treatment area. You don't have these wind issues um, of the wind changing and suddenly you're, um, you're, you're not being able to reach properties along a road because the wind isn't in the right direction. Um, you don't have gaps in your treatment because you have parks and because you have um, open spaces running through the area because you're moving the material from the ground. You don't have um, issues with canyon effects with, with privacy fences along alleys um, because you're treating from the air, not from the ground. Um, so it can be much more efficient um, for air to aerially spray. Um, and, and that brings me to efficiency versus cost. Um, these are, are two maps that I pulled off the Internet um, for Greenville, Mississippi. I realized Dallas is not Greenville, Mississippi, and um, so you don't have as much agriculture areas and open fields. But I wanted to, to, to point out that the, one, the um, map on the left is from ground uh, adulticide application that was done in the area. And you can see, um, particularly in the south part of Greenville, based on the roads that you would have just doing truck spraying, huge gaps in your coverage. Uh, now, this is Greenville, Mississippi, so these are probably pastures or, or crops. I, I really can't tell you that. Um, and so you wouldn't necessarily need to be treating those areas anyway. But what I really want to point out is the coverage that you get. You get this area that you can do with a truck in a night, whereas if you treat it by air, this blue triangle here is roughly the same area as this map over here, and, and you were treating by truck this small area in here, whereas with the airplane you can do all of this plus more in a single night. Um, and so when you start looking at what does it cost to treat by air versus to treat by ground, um, you do really have to look at how many acres that, that you are getting treatment for. So by the air, it may seem like, oh, it's really, really expensive because we're treating 40,000 acres um, and at, you know, just off the top of my head, roughly $2 an acre for that aerial treatment, which would also include the chemical, versus how many trucks you would have to put on the road and how many man hours you have tied up in those trucks, plus the chemical on top of that. Um, actually, the cost of them is is not that um, not that different, uh, and you certainly by going to air spraying, um, it's it's much more efficient as when your goal is to try and kill as many of those infected adult mosquitoes as possible. 
Um, so again, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, and I'm going to talk about larviciding. Again, it's, it's important to suppress the next wave of adult mosquitoes and to suppress that population of mosquitoes out there as low as possible. But you've got to remember that the larviciding you're doing today is reducing risk of infection two to three weeks down the road. It's not doing anything to address um, transmission that is occurring today, tomorrow, next week, because those mosquitoes are not infected um, that are in the water. Also with larviciding, it's, it's if as, as more efficient as adulticiding is over ground adulticiding, larviciding is less efficient. Not that you're not killing as many mosquitoes, because when you find a breeding site, you can kill all of the mosquitoes before they get up and dilute into the environment. The problem is it's much harder to find and treat all of those breeding sites. So the Culex quinquefasciatus, which is the driving vector of West Nile virus in the south, is well known to breed in, in certain habitats, particularly habitats that have dirty water. So things like abandoned swimming pools or swimming pools that are not kept up are a classic example of breeding sites that you would need to locate and treat. And then for Culex, the other, um, in urban areas, the other primary um, larviciding site is actually the storm drains, because this mosquito will readily breed in water underground. Um, it, and it, because it's underground, it's very hard to locate it to treat it especially breeding sites. So what a lot of larviciding programs do in urban areas is they will go down each street and they will treat every single storm drain that they come across um, to larvicide and, and try and suppress the population. So one of the places that larval um, programs have difficulty with and, and don't particularly think of as far as an overlooked Culex habitat is what's at the under, other end of all of these storm drains that you just treated. Where is that water moving? Is it coming to a, a, um, a big area and you don't have enough water flow to, to um, really be moving the, the water downstream? Um, where is it going? Is it going into a a river or a stream that flows? Is it, it just going to a stagnant pool? And a lot of times these areas are, are difficult to access or not well mapped out. So if you don't already have a well-established larviciding program and you're dealing with an outbreak and, and you decide, oh, we're going to expand our larviciding, um, you may actually find it difficult um, with your, your stretched resources and manpower to, to effectively locate all of these larval habitats to treat them. And so larviciding is it's still an important component, um, but it can be more difficult. And if you don't have a larviciding program in place already, uh, it can take quite a bit of effort to find all of these breeding habitats. Um, another overlooked Culex habitat, which is, is relatively recent, and, and you will find this more in newer neighborhoods, are um, a lot of, of new subdivisions have been put in where they collect gray water to do irrigation of lawns. And so they'll have these cisterns on the property itself. And if you're a program who's going through and trying to larvicide a, a neighborhood and you treat all these storm drains, you can still have a significant amount of mosquito breeding in that neighborhood um, just because you're not aware that these cisterns are in every single backyard that that um, you, you just treated in that neighborhood. Uh, and a lot of times the homeowners aren't even aware of that. So you send out a lot of public education 
messaging, you know, clean the bird bath, don't leave the kiddie pool out, don't let water collect in, in the plastic toys, clean your gutters. Um, and a lot of the, the old, older messaging doesn't include if you have these underground storage cisterns for gray water, you need to be, um, you, you need to be checking those and make sure that mosquitoes aren't able to get through the covers and breed in there because the um, Culex mosquitoes, they don't need a very large opening to go through the lid of this cistern and to breed down in that dirty gray water. Um, and, and then another thing that communities are putting in is not all of the wastewater in communities, new, new developments goes directly into, um, not, not all of the sewage goes directly into the municipal sewage plan. A lot of places now have these um, on-site mini sewage treatment plants in, in neighborhoods, and a lot of times they may be difficult to spot or, or the mosquito control entity is not aware of them and are not checking them because they, they may be brand new and they may not be on their, their radar. Um, and they may be a little more obvious, like in this picture where you have these um, these nice cement covers on it. But a lot of them, particularly in, in trailer parks and, and smaller um, areas, may have um, something more like this diagram here where it's a series of settling tanks where the water is, is cleaned up as it moves from from tank to tank, but they have these nice open grates on top, which make them very good uh, Culex breeding sites. So those are a couple of places that you may not necessarily be thinking of already uh, that I just wanted to point out. Um, I do realize there's a wide variety of experience when it comes to uh, treating mosquitoes on the phone, and so um, hopefully somebody found something useful, uh, depending on, on what program you're in, um, in this presentation. Uh, so with that, I, I actually want to leave quite a bit of time for uh, questions and answers. And uh, there is my contact information. Certainly feel free to call or to email me if you have a specific question. Um, or you want to run by what you're, you're already doing for you know, troubleshooting ideas on, on how you could better in, improve uh, what you're doing. Thank you, Dr. McAllister. That was a very helpful presentation. Uh, so now we're going to go to the Q&A at the top of the webinar screen. For those of you who have submitted questions, we're going to move to those now. It'll be just a minute. Yeah, I'm getting rid of my presentation and um, pulling up, trying to pull up the, um, the web meeting. Okay, and for those of you who don't have access to the webinar, we are going to take uh, questions after we finish with these, this first group on the webinar. Okay, and I'm actually going to make that smaller and set it off to the side um, to give people more questions, um, time to write down contact information. Okay, and I have found the questions and answers. I anybody on the webinar, you can see these, but I'll read them out loud for the people who do not have computer access. Um, and the very first question about data available on ages, I'm going to have to defer to Shelley um, because this is a mosquito control um, seminar and I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, yes, if you want, that. <laughs> thank you, Dr. McAllister. Uh, any questions related to the epidemiology of the cases, if you could contact me afterwards, I'd be happy to help you with those questions. And my phone number is 817-264-4529. Thank you for the question. Go ahead, Dr. McAllister. Okay, and there's another question I'm going to weed out really quick, and that's about CEUs for this meeting. I do not know the answer to that. 
Um, so, Shelly, again, that that's your question to answer. Okay, will do. Um, so the first question, how far should traps be placed from a positive pool to help define the area of West Nile virus activity? Um, if you have the resources to add these additional traps uh, from a positive pool, the mosquito in question really stays within a half mile of um, where it emerges. They don't fly very far. So if you have the resources to, to move, a, a, with most people will move about a, um, a mile radius out. Other jurisdictions will go a half mile out. Um, it, that's your, your local resources are going to dictate what you can actually do. Um, let's see, is there a point at which we should switch from ground spraying to aerial spraying? And again, it, it's going to have to be a local decision based on what your resources are. If you're finding you have to treat um, because you have so many positive pools in so many cases uh, and you don't have the trucks to treat all of those areas um, from the ground, then you definitely want to consider switching to aerial spraying because you can be much more effective at it. Um, so there's not a, a hard and fast number uh, because that's there's going to be a lot of factors that would go into making that decision. Um, I believe the, the next question, possibility of getting a copy of the program, and the answer to that is yes, I believe it is going to be made available. Um, and that's actually a couple of the questions on the Q&A. Yes, we're working on making the presentation available if not the actual recording, at least the PowerPoint slides, but that is being looked into. Thank you. And if I'm not mistaken, maybe somebody from the SMOC can correct me, but that was all of the question and answers that I have on my screen, unless there's another button I need to push. This is Mike of the SMOC. Uh, we only had those, those six questions posted. Okay. Okay. Well, then we can open up the individuals on the phone line, those of you who don't have access to the webinar. If you have questions, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out the general area where you are because I know we have individuals from health departments and municipalities. If you could just try to respond accordingly. And I, also know we have people from other areas of the state on this call. Yeah. Um, do we have anyone from Tarrant or Dallas County that would like to ask a question? Yeah, and Shelly, while, while they're unmuting their phones, there was one more question that came in on the computer screen. Um, and they wanted me to... Um, Describe how Culex differs from other mosquitoes as, as far as habitat. Um, the Culex quinquefasciatus is a um, container breeding mosquito that has a uh, it, it has a asynchronous life cycle, and what I mean by that is that there are every, every night there are Egg, new eggs being laid, there are new adults emerging. Um, they like, tend to prefer dirty water, um, but they can breed in water that, that appears to be quite clean. And that is different from other mosquito species, um, particularly the Aedes and the Seraphora which are usually considered more nuisance mosquitoes because they breed, they're, they're what are called floodwater breeders, so they lay their eggs next to, to on, on the surface of the water, around the edges of containers, um, and their eggs 
need are, are dependent on rain to or irrigation to flood them and because all of a sudden the water moves up all of these eggs hatch at once um, the larval larvae develop in a group and they tend to emerge in a group um, so that's one of the major differences between the culex and most of the other species that are in, in urban habitats. We had one other question uh, get posted into the chat box. I've added that to the q and I, I see that. Typically, what is the effective kill rate for aerial spraying? Um, usually, um, 80 to or, or greater percent of, of the population. But again, it depends because Culex, you have re-emergence every night. Um, that's why we recommend that you do multiple sprains in an area to catch those mosquitoes that are re-emerging. And that's why over time, um, you'll get mosquitoes back into an area. So, but um, with the aerial spray, you can, can really knock down that population, even with just one spray. So okay. can, can we go to the phone? All first? guests have been unmuted. OK, if we can go back to the counties. Does anyone in Dallas, Tarrant, Denton, or Collins County have any questions from any jurisdiction? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Jeff Crocker with the uh, City of Garland in Dallas County. I had a question about uh, when we should resume our uh, ground applications after the uh, uh, aerial spraying that's about to occur. So are you, are you talking about ground applications in the area where the actual aerial spraying is going to occur? Yes. Okay. Um, I would base resuming ground application on surveillance in that area. So after they do the aerial spraying, once you're, it, presumably that's going to knock your trap count down, and I wouldn't necessarily go back and start spraying again until they started coming back up. Uh, excuse me, if you're not... Uh, asking a question, can you please mute your phone? We're getting a lot of background noise. Thank you. Did, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. That, that's what we were planning on doing. I was making sure that was a, 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 a yeah. good decision. That's a good decision. Thank you. Is there anyone else from those four counties that has a question? Okay, we're going to move on to the surrounding counties of Dallas-Fort Worth. Anyone from Parker, Hood, Johnson, Ellis, Kaufman, Hunt? Anybody else in those areas? Okay, Grayson County, Fannin, Navarro. Anybody else in there? Okay, I think we have covered most of the people that are on the call from Region 3, and it looks like on the phone line we have people from other regions on the call. It looks like we have quite a few uh, uh, 512 Austin area numbers. Do we have anybody from DSHS Central Office or anyone in the Austin area that would like to ask a question? Uh, I, I tried to incorporate questions from the last one into my talk to try and head them off, so I, okay. I'm going to take that as I did a good job. Yeah, <laughs> like it. It uh, looks like we have people from the Houston area as well. We have 713 area code on here. Anyone from 713 or 903 area code? 
We also had two additional questions get posted to the chat. I've just added those to the Q&A. Okay. Um, okay. Is there a rule of thumb or estimate of how many mosquitoes there are in the Metroplex? And I have no way of answering that question. Um, it, it changes nightly again. Um, there's a lot of spray missions going on, so the number of mosquitoes is going down from that, but it's also being replenished by new larvae emerging as adults. And and that's why it, it, it's so important to continue to do your surveillance and to set your mosquito traps so you can get an idea of whether the population is going up or, or going down. Um, and then, is it practical to spray the rural areas of a county? Um, and for this particular mosquito, spraying rural areas um, by air is is actually not that practical because this mosquito is a, a very urban mosquito. Um, unless you have dairy farms or hog farms, but it's actually more practical to treat them than to, to just treat a rural area. Um, with that said, though, treating parts of the rural area by ground and is, done. is practical to protect the people, particularly if you have um, transmission happening in, in little clusters of houses out in the rural area. Um, Will household bleach break down the activity of BTI um, briquettes when placed in stagnant pools together? Um, I am not 100% sure. I know if you have treated a stagnant pool by putting fish in it, the bleach will kill the fish, but I do not know if it um, will break down the BTI briquettes. I, I would have to investigate that. I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. We do have one more question that will be posted here momentarily. Okay. Okay, I stated aerial spraying is is 80 percent or or higher would be a, considered a good kill rate for um, aerial spraying, and the ground rate if if you get good coverage um, of an area, you should see a, a similar rate decrease in in population or, or in trap numbers, a, a minimum of 80%. You may actually, from both air and ground, see more than 80% reduction. Okay, do we have any other questions from the phone lines? This is Rosemary in the State Operations Center of Texas. Will there be regular conference call scheduled for West Nile virus? Uh, that's not something that I can answer. Are you, are you referring just to the vector control issues? Or are you, there, there's a lot of different conference calls, but if you're just referring I'm, just to this. I'm referring uh, this just to only, the vector control. Dr. McAllister has only been available for these two times. We don't anticipate. Uh, any more availability from her, but in terms of vector control conference calls, that is something that I can't answer. It would be uh, probably need to be answered by Dr. Sidwell or someone else in the central office on us this program. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Dr. Stone Cipher, this is Tom said, well, uh, that would actually be a question for the